All right, thank you very much. I'm going to try and cram about a million slides into 20 minutes. And, and uh, so just remind me as I'm approaching. Oh, it's right here all, uh, when I'm approaching the end. So I'll talk about the next 100 years. It's funny, when Rob asked me to talk about this topic, he asked me quite sheepishly. He thought, well, 100 years is a rather long time out, not realizing that I'm an evolutionary theorist. And f for an evolutionary theorist, 100 years, <laughs> that's sort of like a second to an economist. So I'm going to talk about millions of years. And that motif there of the, of the monolith is going to recur over the course of this talk, the monolith from 2001. Um, so what I work on is the evolution of intelligence in the universe, from the Big Bang to the brain. It's very modest. Uh, and this is the extraordinary fact of the universe, and that is that over just under about 13.77 billion years, the universe, through purely natural processes, through atomic fission and fusion and uh, stellar nuclear synthesis and sort of gravitational accretion and natural selection, created a component of the sort the universe has printed, a component that makes it capable of understanding its own past and its own future. And that component is us. Right? In some sense, us and other potentially self-conscious entities in the universe are in some sense the CPU of the universe. It's a metaphor, but it's true. Right? It took a while for the universe to be able to grasp itself. And that's what I struggle with, I guess, as a researcher. Uh, I want to point some, make some points about time. <laughs> oh, yes. Get out of the way of my projector. Um, <laughs> Just from the evolutionary perspective, let's make some sobering remarks about time. We heard yesterday from Peter about these chaps, and you all know what happened to them, right? About 66 million years ago, 75% of all life on Earth was eliminated, okay? Uh, if you go back a bit further to 250 million years ago, the so-called, this bigger extinction event, the Permian-Triassic extinction, that was 95% of life on Earth. So these things happen, they're going to happen again. Right? And it's worth bearing that in mind uh, when you uh, take a perspective on, a very optimistic perspective on the future. And this is why, by the way, I think space exploration is so important uh, for us and our species. And not content to let natural phenomena destroy us, we create things like this, uh, which also have the capability of destroying us. And it's worth bearing in mind, you know, uh, October 1962 or September 1983, uh, both of which were dates where we came very close to completely annihilating all life on Earth. Now, on shorter time scales, most of our history has been a history of stasis. Here's a painting of uh, warfare during the 15th century. Uh, this is the Battle of the Roses when the Lancasters were duking it out with the Yorks, where the Duke of York was killed. Uh, this is a picture from the 12th century, and this is a picture from the 17th century. And the fact is, there's no difference. Warfare over many hundreds of years was exactly the same. You went to battle in your suit of armor with a sword or a, or a lance or, or a pike, um, even though gunpowder was essentially available in Western Europe in the 15th century, it was not deployed at scale until the Napoleonic Wars at the end of the 18th. And what's true for warfare was true for education, it's true for politics, it was true for medicine. And it gets worse because, in fact, most of human history has been devolutionary. Uh, some of you will recognize this. It's the Antikythera mechanism. It was discovered some, by some... Uh, Sponge fisherman. Uh, it's essentially an analog computer that was built in the first century BC. Okay? And the closest that it comes to a modern device is an armillary sphere, one of those devices that models the orbit of the planets and their satellites around the sun. 1,700 years later, for asserting that this was the case, Giordano Bruno uh, was burned at the stake in Rome. So we, we often lose knowledge. It's not all about cumulative uh, gain of information, it's often about loss. And then there's heterogeneity. You have a sort of a primitive space age society like Chicago today, uh, and if you look at a, a, syn a synchronous, uh, that's sort of true, a primitive space age, right? Uh, if you look at a synchronous society in the Amazon, here's one of the so-called uncontacted tribes, of which there are about 70 in the Amazon alone, and, and they're not yet using metals. They used to be called the Lost Tribes, and you sort of wonder who exactly was lost. <laughs> um, so let's get back to these monoliths. What is a monolith? It's an idea or an invention that significantly accelerates the pace of evolutionary change, in particular with regard to intelligence. So that's what I want to talk about. And I need to introduce you to a paradox. 
This is a schematic of the evolution of, 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 of primate lineages. Just to remind you, we bifurcated from the gorillas and chimps about six million years ago. That the hominid lineage um, appeared about uh, two and a half million years ago. Archaic uh, Homo sapiens, about 400,000. And anatomically modern humans are only about 200,000 years old. That is, they're indistinguishable anatomically from us. Most of what's been talked about at this meeting is culture. And culture is tens of thousands, cave paintings, uh, to tens of years, digital computing is years old. Right? It's extraordinarily recent, and it raises a very weird paradox. And it's this. Right? 21st century culture runs on hundreds of thousand-year-old technology. Okay? It's actually very weird. Uh, let me just make that more concrete. Uh, some of you, not you young whippersnappers, um, will recognize that machine. It's called the TRS-80. It was an 8-bit Zilog Z80 machine. You recognize it. Um, the Trash 80 to its foes. That's right. Uh, it had 1K of video RAM. Um, anyway. Uh, now imagine, <laughs> imagine you were to turn that machine on, and this happened. It's impossible, okay? That's a modern operating system. It requires 32-bit uh, addresses. Um, just to run the operating system requires gigabytes of memory. How is it that our brain, 200,000-year-old brain, can run Jackson Pollock, all right? It can run group theory and string theory, right? But we can't get machines to run modern operating systems after decades. And the reason it's possible is because our metaphor for the way the brain works is wrong. The brain is not a computer made up of fixed circuitry. It's more like an ant colony. Okay? The brain is constantly reconfiguring and rewiring under new inputs. In fact, this is a video of two nerve cells deciding whether they want to form an association. Technically, it's an oligodendrocyte that's going to myelinate the axon of a pyramidal cell. And so, but they make decisions uh, based on compatibility. But I do believe that there are limits to the adaptability of the human brain. And I think the 22nd century is when we're going to hit it. And I think, arguably, we're hitting it already. And so this is, what I'm going to, this is my alarming part of the talk, to claim that, in fact, uh, human beings are going to be significantly deprecated as a species in the, over the next century. Um, to talk about intelligence, you have to talk about difficulty. It's amazing how often people talk about it without talking about difficulty. Uh, if I were to give you this puzzle on the left uh, during my talk and ask you to solve it during the course of my lecture, very few of you would be volunteering the solution at the end. It would be almost embarrassing. On the other hand, if I gave you a Rubik's Cube and you solved it in 20 minutes, you probably would be very proud. So here is a guy who took 26 years to solve the Uru's Cube. And, and you'd probably say, not a particularly smart individual. Um, on the other hand, here's someone who solved it in two minutes and 30 sec seconds uh, blindfolded. And uh, you'd probably say he's very smart. But the point is, is that this guy was essentially random searching a very large state space. And this guy was using an algorithm. Right? And so rules and algorithms are how we solve difficult problems. And what are difficult problems? They're difficult search problems. Things that, so if you think about it, um, something that you think of as hard is something where there are many, many possible solutions and it takes you an awfully long time to arrive at it. So intelligence is essentially taking hard problems and making them easy. That's the, essentially the most basic definition of what intelligence is. And if you think about your smart friends or yourselves, if you're all very smart, that's what you do. You take problems that other people have described as difficult, and you demonstrate how they can be rendered easy. Now, I give lots of talks about intelligence, and many people ask me about stupidity. They'll say, wait a minute. <laughs> and I've reached a point now where I could give an entire course on stupidity. <laughs> And the point is that it's stupidity is not just the absence of intelligence. It's worse. Stupidity is actually when you take a very easy problem and you make it hard. Right? And, and in fact, there's even a cultural euphemism, and it's called bureaucracy. It's extraordinary. So we even have, all right, this is my libertarian streak. But nevertheless, um, this is actually quite serious, and uh, we should take stupidity very seriously.
Uh, it's not just ignorance, right? So I'm going to emphasize now these strange cultural monoliths, which are um, sometimes called cognitive artifacts. And they're things that have turned hard problems into easy problems. And there'll be things like chessboards and the abacus, numbers and perhaps computers, but I'm not sure. So how many of you tried to play chess without a chessboard? It's really hard. Uh, my grandfather was a chess master, and he used to be able to beat me uh, blindfolded, without a board, obviously, uh, and I had the board in front of me. And so in the 40s and 50s, people started to study chess masters. And this is how you do it. You strap onto their head one of those devices, a bit out of date, um, and uh, what you do is you configure a board, and then you track where their eyes look on the chessboard. And you look to where they look first when they, essentially, when the board is revealed. And you do the same thing with novices. So you take a problem like this, which is mate in three. Russians in the audience have already seen it. Uh, the rest of you will take ours. Um, and what, what, what novices do, what novices do is novices look at the pieces and experiment with what they could do with them. Experts look at the spaces to which the pieces would move. Okay. Okay. They actually look at the solution. The first thing that an expert does is look at the solution without playing with the configuration of the pieces. And the reason they can do that is because the chessboard has been internalized in visual memory. And we'll get to that in a second. So this is the point I want you to keep in your head, the idea that true cognitive devices can be thrown away once you've become accustomed to them. <coughs> once you've learned the chessboard, you no longer need the chessboard. <coughs> Watch this video. Hope the sound works. Eight years of hard slumming in the British Jewel Drop in the Zones. 12 year old Kotek Azuka is top of the class. I practice two hours on weekdays and 10 hours on the weekend. I want to become a national champion. Along with the other high flyers, he can have a huge calculations with a purely imagined abacus, manipulating nothing but thin air. Children like this shows that with enough practice, super fast mental calculation is possible. Hi! Hi! Really? So it's extraordinary to watch, right? Uh, and you, if you ask what makes for good education, it's schools with extraordinary discipline, right? That's, that's what you really see in that video. None of this self-educating, laissez-faire education. It's learning like a samurai. That's how you learn. But the point is that... But again, I want you to remember, this is the point about the abacus. It's, it's internalized. And people have now taken that. Actually, actually called, well, let me make one further point. What do novice abacus users do that's different from expert abacus users is that you use, novices, I'm assuming most of your novice ab abacus users, <laughs> use the prefrontal cortex. They do visual cortex. It's not a liberation. It's a bit like being adept at a sport. It's automatized. Okay? So the abacus is internalized, and it makes you generally smarter. This is an interesting experiment that's being uh, conducted in the Sudan, where they're teaching kids the mental abacus, and they're finding extraordinary things. They're not just better at arithmetic, they're better at a whole range of analytical and geometric tasks, because they have in their head this extraordinary affordance. We should all be trained on the abacus. It makes us all smarter. Here's another example. Numbers. It happens to be a hobby of mine, the evolution of number systems. Um, extraordinary things in their own right. We can talk about those later. Uh, but the point I want to make is that if I asked you to perform a very simple calculation with Roman numerals, uh, like multiplying those two together, you'd be stumped. It's hard. You can't really do it. You can't really do long division with Roman numerals, right? If you do it with Arabic numerals, though, it's easy, relatively easy. So it's not you that's super smart. It's the number system. And once I've given you the right number system, right, you can solve problems that you otherwise couldn't solve. You didn't invent it. You should not take the credit for it. Okay? And now I'm going to show you a video of a chimpanzee that's solving the following task. I'm going to flash up a, a bunch of numbers on a screen, and it has to click them in order of their uh, magnitude. This footage from Kyoto University Primate Research Institute shows a young chimpanzee taking a memory test. Not only is he reading and understanding the numbers, 
He's able to remember their exact positions after seeing them flash on the screen for less than a second. Apes consistently get ten in a row correct, while humans rarely reach six before failing. So humans rarely reach six before failing. This is an important point, and, and what's happening here is that we're not actually better at numbers than, than other primates. Uh, one plus one is easy for us, and it's easy for a monkey. The point is, because we have an efficient representation of numerosity, of number, a thousand plus a thousand for us is no harder than one plus one. But it would be a thousand times harder for a chimp. Because it doesn't have this cognitive artifact, this peculiar monolith, that allows it to solve easy problems, well, make difficult search problems easy. That's what numbers do. Good number systems. Crappy number systems, like Roman, don't. So the ultimate monolith, I, wasn't, I had to miss this morning's presentation, so I apologize. Um, but people are claiming, perhaps, that the computer is the ultimate monolith. It even looks like one. And I want to sort of wrap up by having a conversation about whether this is true or not. And I don't know, by the way. I run an institute that's super techy, but I worry sometimes. And I, and I think we have to have a serious conversation at this point in our cultural evolution. The reason people get so excited about it is all, all these exponential trends, and, I, and I'm, perhaps that was discussed this morning, but essentially uh, the derivative um, phenomena that ensue from Moore's law, um, these kinds of plots um, uh, that demonstrate, you know, essentially exponential increases in the density of CPUs or reductions in exponential reductions in cost of storage. Uh, and it's leading to a very utopian worldview about the future. And I think in some cases, deservedly, uh, but in some cases, it's really messing things up for us. Uh, when I was a kid watching James Bond movies, uh, that's what Q looked like, and that's what he built. Extraordinarily cool things. You know, watches that were super magnets or... Uh, you know, pens that would blow holes in safes. And now, Q is this guy. He's a total nerd of very little interest. And you can see Daniel Craig is sort of utterly demoralized there in the background. <laughs> he's just saying, where's my sort of new super watch? And, uh, and he's, no, I'm going to write software. The point about this, if you've watched it, is he's deploying algorithms whose solutions he does not comprehend. And that's what I want to get to. And, and that comes up in the movie, actually. So this technology is doing amazing things. Uh, this is part of my world. Uh, we're solving problems with machine learning algorithms that would have taken thousands of years if individuals had to analyze the data. Uh, we're doing extraordinary visualizations. But increasingly, when I go to conferences, people say, you know what we, we call these things now? We call them radiculograms. That's what they're saying, no more visualizations. And the reason they're saying it is because we can't comprehend them. They look like beautiful artwork, but they tell us nothing. Okay? And so there's this interesting uh, re request that science not only become uh, a discipline of prediction, but a discipline of explanation, which means it has to interface with the human brain. Okay? And so the question that I ask you is, should the computer, this extraordinary potential next monolith that's obviously changing our society. Should it be an abacus or is it an automobile? And let me explain what I mean by that. So I showed you what an abacus does. You already know that. It increases our ability to calculate, but it also gives us these extraordinary uh, endogenized cognitive affordances that in some sense make us smarter in its absence. An automobile also does extraordinary things. If you have a level surface, uh, surface, it increases your velocity and our freedom. On the other hand, it reduces our ability to walk, literally, because someone's going to hit you and kill you. If you I mean, this is something I had to learn in the United States. Um, <laughs> but it also gives rise to all sorts of uh, unforeseen cardiovascular pathologies, because you spend all of your life uh, basically with a bum stuck on a car seat, not moving. It also leads to all sorts of energy issues. And the question I want to ask you all is, what is the computer? Is it this? Something that in some sense is going to make us smarter? Or is it this? Something that in some sense frees us but enslaves us? Now, I don't, would you allow me to show a two-minute clip? Yes. So here's a... Yeah, he, he's the boss. He's the boss. But...
as Director of Weapons Research and Development. I commissioned last year a study of this project by the Black Corporation. Based on the findings of the report, my conclusion was that this idea was not a practical research for reasons which at this moment must be all too obvious. Then you mean it is possible for them to have built such a thing? Mr. President, the technology required is easily within the means of even the smallest nuclear power. It requires only the will to do so. But how is it possible for this thing to be triggered automatically and at the same time impossible to untrigger? Mr. President, it is not only possible, it is essential. That is the whole idea of this machine, you know. Deterrence is the art of producing in the mind of the enemy the fear to attack. And so because of the automated and irrevocable decision-making process which rules out human meddling, the doomsday machine is terrified, it's simple to understand, and completely credible and convincing. Gee, I wish we had one of those machines, thank you. But this is fantastic, strange enough. How can it be triggered automatically? Well, it's uh, remarkably simple to do that. When you merely wish to bury bombs, there's no limit to the size. After that, they are connected to a gigantic complex of computers. Now then, a specific and clearly defined set of circumstances under which the bombs are to be exploded is programmed into a deep memory bank. All right. <laughs> Such a marvelous film. I have to watch the entire movie. Uh, but the point is, our fear about the future isn't really the fear of the matrix, right? Uh, the fear is sieging uh, cognition and moral decision-making to machines. And uh, again, it's not to say that they can't help us, but I think they should be helping us as an abacus uh, and not as an automobile. Uh, and so, uh, thank you very much for your time.